book of Revelation. We are in chapter 8, and yet what I want to do is just take a pause and back up one verse into chapter 7, and it's chapter 7, verse 17. And as you turn to, to um, chapter 8, I just want to read that verse because I love the tie-in. I love how the Lord ties our, our studies together. The verse reads, For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Remember we talked about the good shepherd if you were here for the psalm study on Thursday. We did Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want or be in lack. Here, those who have gathered around the throne in heaven know this, that the Lord is their shepherd. And, he, and he's going to look at the end. It says, he will guide them to springs of living water. Now, what's cool about that idea is, um, especially you know, this season in the four corners with the moisture in the ground or the moisture in the air coming to the ground, we have a lot more dew or residue in the mornings. You know, that's why the frost is starting to build. Maybe you've seen that. But, but you know what's interesting about shepherds? Shepherds in the real world will stir their sheep, their flock, early in the mornings to get them out into the field so they can be nourished not only by the grass that's in those fields, but by the dew, the heavy dew that is laden on the grass. And you know what's incredible about that dew? Is sheep can survive days if not weeks, if they're given that good substance, that dew in the morning. It would, it's just like going to the water hole. So, though you're here at second service, it still kind of fits. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't gotten up quite as early. I noticed a couple guys weren't even quite awake yet at second service. But isn't it cool to know that the Lord meets us with the goodness of his word and the refreshment that it brings as we get up to meet him and we dive into it and go, okay, Lord, here we are. Hmm. Good, good to know, amen. Let's, let's pray that the Lord would just bless our, our morning and our study. Father, we do just turn again our hearts to you. We, Father, we thank you so much for songs, God, of praise and adoration of you, the worthy king, the worthy one, our one and only God and Savior. And Lord, we do ask at this time as we have opened your word that we would just dive in, Lord, that you would give us a thirst for it, Lord, that we would continue to rise early, Jesus, to be nourished by it, not just on Sundays, but Lord, day by day, Lord, all for your glory, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I want to ask you a few questions before we dive into chapter eight to see, to make sure that we're kind of on the same page. You okay with that? I know it's Thursdays where we usually do the interaction, but hey, you know what? Keeping you guys kind of on the edge of your seats. Okay, first question. Whose revelation is this book of revelation? Whose? Jesus Christ. It's the, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, and it was given to him by the Father, right? Okay, next question. What is the purpose of this book of revelation? What's, what's its purpose? You know there's a purpose to it? Go to chapter 1. Look at it. Very beginning of it. it. Was given that we, his servants, remember that word is saint, or excuse me, slaves, that we might be given or have revealed to us things that must take place very soon for the time is approaching rapidly. Remember that? That's the purpose. This book of Revelation is given to us that we can be informed. Not in the dark, you know, not bewildered, not freaked out, but that we can be in the know of things to come. Isn't that awesome? That's the purpose of this book. Okay, another question. You ready? I notice no one asked, has raised their hand to answer. <laughs> okay, third question. Is there something unique about this book compared to all other books? Hey, there's a hand. <laughs> There's a blessing. There's a blessing for all. Chapter 1, verse 3. Read it out loud. Somebody, go. That was almost out loud. (laughs) (laughs) 
I should have given her a mic. It says, blessed are all those who read it and seek to understand it and take it in. Isn't that cool? There's a blessing, a built-in blessing in this book. That's unique. Of all scripture, this one has that blessing for us. How incredible. Okay. Now, last question. Where can we find the simple outline, the key that unlocks the mystery to this book of Revelation? Where is it? Come on. Don't whisper it to somebody next to you. Say it out loud. Go ahead, Luann. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 19, right? There is Jesus, again, directing John. He's speaking to John, and he declares to him, John, write the things that you have seen. Remember the fingers? There's the first section. Write the things that are. There's the second section. And write the things that will take place after, metatauta, after these things. There's the outline. Chapter 1 is this, the, the thing that he saw, the Lord glorified. He wrote about that which he saw. And then secondly, he wrote about the things that are, the church, the church age, chapters 2 and 3. And then by chapter 4, we get into that third section. We're in the midst of it. We've studied actually all the way through chapter 17, or excuse me, chapter 7, and we find ourselves there as we finish chapter 7, almost at the end of the first set of judgments. And those judgments would be called what if we subtitled them something? We'd call them the seal judgments, right? For it is the scroll that the lamb who was slain, the Lord Jesus, has taken hold of. And he has begun to loose those seals one by one. And we've seen the coming judgment at the hand of the Lord himself. <clears throat> well, these, as with the next two sets of judgments, the trumpet and then the vile or bold judgments, <clears throat> They are none other than God's righteous wrath on a sin-sick and Christ-rejecting world. And they will be like none other. They will be unique like none other. Whether we're recalling times in the past where we look at Scripture and we recount where God has judged His people or the world with the, with the flood... Or if we are thinking of the perilous groaning of the earth presently. As we hear about storms and earthquakes around this globe. They are all, they are all but a foreshadow. Those groanings of the earth, they're, they're the sign that this earth, this world is in the grip of the fall of sin. But one day it will be loosed. And, and these episodes that we are looking at in the book of Revelation, the Bible tells us again and again, and Jesus specifically say that they will be a time like no other, like never before seen. And we've come to a very interesting phase in their unfolding Chapter 8 now, verse 1, read with me. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Wow. That's quite a dramatic change, isn't it? A drastic difference here. From those, those shouts of adoration and declaration of, of who it was that that, that beautiful gathering had come to worship. The lamb, the shepherd. And now those, those shouts of praise, they've, they've, turned to, they've turned into a divine time of silence. More than just a moment. It says specifically it's a half of an hour that there is still and quiet in heaven. Wow. 
Now, if there's anything that we can take away from this, that we can gain from that little bit of detail, it's this. That what is taking place, what has already begun and and what will be fulfilled in the judgments of God is serious. It's not a flippant thing that God is doing. It's incredibly impacting. And we'll see this heavenly pause once again, actually at the end of the next cycle of judgments between the sixth and the second or the seventh trumpet judgment. But as we, as we open this or see this seventh seal opened, what we realize is that we don't have <clears throat> another element of God's wrath necessarily, but rather a link to that next set, that whole set of God's judgments on the earth. Now there are some, maybe some even here this morning that that have asked or maybe you're even questioning why in the world, why God, all of these judgments? Why so many? Why continue to pummel the earth again and again with constant barrages of intense wrath and judgment? Well, believe it or not, what, what is taking place here is we would say a last ditch effort for the Lord. It's his attempt one last time. His attempt to draw humanity to repentance. C.S. Lewis put it something like this. That a glutton, he can be in the midst of gorging himself with Delicacies unknown to the rest of man's palate. And he will miss the pleasures that he's in the midst of. Isn't that like us as Americans? We have such bounty, such ease and pleasure in our life that we don't even know it. We don't even see it. Well, C.S. Lewis says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pains. God's going to change his tactics here. He he has poured out his grace for 2,000 plus years. And by and large, hearts have refused it. So in changing his tactics, he will seek yet again to to scream if he need be into the lives of humanity that they would turn and repent and come to salvation. I think you and I would, would agree that We as humans are a stubborn lot. Amen? And yet what we will see as we study through these passages of the continued judgment and wrath upon earth and upon this sin-sick, Christ-rejecting population It will intense. It will be more and more intense. It will intensify that rebelliousness, that stubbornness. For just like those who cried out, we just heard them, they cried out for creation, the rocks and the mountains to to fall on them and in a sense to save them from the wrath of the one who sits on the throne and from the Lamb, calling out to creation instead of to the Creator. And just like them, others we will see. Well, turn the page. Keep your 
your finger there if you need, but turn to chapter 9 and go with me to the 20th and 21st verse of that chapter. And notice what others will do. It says there, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons or idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Wow. Folks, what we must do, what we must continue to remind ourselves to do is to realize that as we come to understand these things that will take place, as we come to see that God's wrath is going to be poured out, that it is done by a God, the God of the Bible, who is not just loving, but he is just. His, he is a just and a loving God. And though we, we, many times we can't encompass it, we can't begin to comprehend it, and yet it is nonetheless true that he does it in his justice, and he does it in his love. Verse 2, chapter 8. Then I saw the seven angels who stood before the Lord, and seven trumpets were given to them. Interesting crew here. And they're a specific crew. It's, it's the seven angels who stood before the Lord. This is a, a, a unique and you might say outstanding group of angels. In their number might be Michael, the archangel. For elsewhere in scripture, we, we hear that he stands before the Lord. And these seven are given trumpets. Now this is more like a, a bugle than what we would consider a trumpet for a, an instrumental band or a, an orchestra. And a trumpet usually is not put into a musical setting. But this horn that's translated trumpet was known then in the days of the, the nation of Israel. For it would be the, the horn that was sounded to, to assemble the people or to move out the troops or to inter, introduce a new king. This trumpet had a very distinct sound. And each of these angels were given one. But before they go and do their bidding, notice verse 3. Another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on a golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of of the angel. What an incredible scene we have here. Amen? What a visual for John to take in. Yet, yet another angel comes, you might say, right in front of those seven that have just taken their bugles, and he steps right in front of them, and he, he has with him a bowl that has incense in it, but then we understand it's mingled with the prayers of the saints. Do you know that your prayers throughout your life, they're not forgotten of God? Do you know he, he collects them? He keeps them. He puts them in, in the care of mighty angels. You know another thing about your prayers? Has anybody had a prayer not answered? Now, now, wait a minute. Some of our prayers have been answered, no. But we don't like that answer. So we're going to you know, kind of put it off and, and wait for another answer, right? But there are, are some of those prayers that just haven't been answered of the Lord yet. You know, this is a reference to some of those prayers anyway. 
Those unanswered prayers, he's kept them. And now they go before the Lord, rising before him as a sweet-smelling aroma. And just like the prayers, you remember the prayers of the martyred saints that were under this very same altar? What was their prayer? God, vindicate us. God, bring your justice. God, release us from this bondage of sorts. And yet, what were they told? Just like you and I, sometimes with our prayer. Be patient. Wait. Well, it seems that now the waiting is over. And just like their prayers are un, our un, our unanswered prayers here are answered. Those desperate pleas are brought to bear before God. And he will bring his answer. Verse 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder and rumblings, flashing of lightning and an earthquake. And now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. This would be considered, or we could call this, a prelude to judgment. The stage is now set. And what's fascinating as we watch these next seven judgments unfold is that the first four are wrapped up in the first six verses of this chapter. And the last three, they take us all the way through chapters 9 through 11. Hmm. The first four, they, they are focused on, concentrated on the effect that they will have and they will be on planet Earth. The ecosystem, if you will, the atmosphere of this globe. And the latter three, they deal directly with and have an effect on the lives of the rest of humanity that is left behind. And pointedly, they have an effect, these judgments do, on the spiritual lives. And you might say the insanity that will come upon mankind during this time. So, verse 7. The first angel blew his trumpet. And there followed hail and fire. Remember where hail and fire were brought down before? There was Sodom and Gomorrah. I believe there was an episode in Egypt. Well, here again, yet like never before. Hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth. And the outcome? Here it is. A third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Can I ask a question? Has anybody seen some of the reports, maybe some of the, the, the video um, clips of some of the storms this last season, hailstorms specifically in the Midwest? I, I saw hailstones bigger than my fist. And yet, in comparison to this, that will seem like a cool breeze in the air. How about, how about the, the blizzard that just hit up north? Was it in North Dakota? South Dakota? Few of you heard about it? No, it killed 75,000 head of cattle in 24 hours. That's just... That's just a, a, the beginning of this winter. We're not supposed to have those kind of storms, I thought. Fascinating, isn't it? Yet again, nothing will compare to what they will encounter. 
with this fantastic show of power and note restraint, you know what God is declaring here? You know what is being indicated to all those on earth? He's in control and they're not. Do you see that? God is sovereign over all. Even these times of wrath, he is in control. And, and as, he, as he pours out this, this judgment on the earth, note this. For as he does in a very real way, he, he's taking out of the way many, some if not many of the obstacles or idols that mankind has propped up for himself. Think about it. It says one third of the earth was torched. You know what a lot of the earth has on it these days? Structures that man has built. One third of them decimated by this first bit of judgment. Many of those structures are not just made by man, but they're made for the prestige of man or the places of worship. And I'm not even talking about some of the churches that are like that. But other temples or other places that men, mankind goes and adores. They're to be wiped out. Along with the trees and the grass. Does anybody here know that, that God isn't into obstacles? <laughs> Those things that get between you and him? Who, who knows that? Who, who's, been a taught, who's been taught a lesson or two about some of those idols or obstacles that we've put in the way? Whether it be a bank account, whether it be a spouse or a child or a job or a dream. If we put it between us and God, God will do whatever is needed to get it out of the way. That there is no obstacle no idol between us and him. They're gonna, the world will learn that lesson on a huge scale at this time. And, and though this judgment isn't directly pointed at man, imagine the indirect effect that will be on man. Uh, uh, imagine just the food shortage that will begin to set in to planet Earth. Imagine, along with it, the economic balance that will be blown to smithereens. And aren't we into keeping tabs on every stinking little move in whatever market it is? And it's like God's going to go and squish it and go, that doesn't bring Security either. Imagine, just with this first leg, if you will, this first bit of the judgment that is being poured out, imagine the health issues that will arise. You know when they have those days, not so much up here, but they have them in big cities. They have no fire days. Can't make a fire in your fireplace at home because the smog is so bad. Imagine, a third of the earth is torched. A third of the forests are torched. Along with, it says, all of the grass. That's a big smoke plume, isn't it? Wow. But again, it's just the first. Now for the next, verse 8. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. 
And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Wow, that, that's quite an object, isn't it? Here, here again, John in his, the limitations of his language, he's trying to define this heavenly vision. And he goes, it was something like a big old stinking mountain. And it's coming to earth. And it splashes down right in the midst of the ocean. Could it be one of those asteroids or a comet? And whether it was, you know, calculated or not calculated to hit, it does. And it brings, again, devastation. It, it's told us that on any given day in the sea trade throughout the globe, and this is just commercial, this is not privately owned vessels, but that on any given day there are over 25,000 tankers and or cargo ships on the seaways. So what does that mean? It means... When this judgment hits, that over 8,000 of those ships will be sunk. Do you imagine that? Imagine the chaos, the calamity that will befall mankind. Imagine the tidal waves. Wow. Now, we've had all sorts of Hollywood renditions of this, haven't we? You know, and the, the cute guy and the girl, they, they go out there and somehow save the day, you know, and get it to blow up before it's ever anywhere close. And yay, everyone lives happily ever after. Well, folks, there will be no stopping. There will be no destroying this bad boy. For God has it on a course to do its bidding, to do his bidding. And yet with the Hollywood renditions, we do get a glimpse of maybe some of the chaos, some of the confusion that will be wrought by something like this. And yet it will, again, all, it will pale in comparison. They, comp they pale in comparison. And with the first, there was destruction on the land. With the second, it was through the seas. And if we can even begin to imagine the, the devastation, it, it seems to be just insurmountable, wouldn't you say? Like how in the world? We've seen some of the videos of the effects of, in the last three, four years, Two huge, considered fairly large tsunamis. And the devastation on, you know, those eastern countries. The seashores. Communities. Still in shambles today. Those are like a drop in the bucket. Compared to what? The judgment, the judgments of God will bring. And the turmoil that this planet will see. Verse 10. The third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. Man, we can't miss, but this is a definition of a comet or a star, falling star. And this baby, again, it, it hits the earth. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star was, or is, Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Huh. As if 
the judgments on the land and the sea weren't enough to cripple this earth, to cause it and the population on it to be broken and fall to their knees. Here now, the third trumpet blows. And a dreadful blow it is to the earth. It's like sage. You know, sage is a, a bitter herb, isn't it? And, and the bitterness of this star, nicknamed wormwood, which means bitterness, this star symbolizes what life on earth will be like once it hits. It will be bitter. The most bitter. It will be bitter to even attempt to live out life. Now, if, if you're not from other parts of the nation, parts like Florida, or Georgia, the, the Gulf Coast, where they have quite frequently experienced hurricanes, then you really don't understand what the, the idea of a run on water is. Has anybody ever experienced that? Being, in a, being you know, in a place that's preparing for a storm? A run on water. The, the, the way I equated it was <clears throat> some years ago, we had a, a chance to take a bunch of kids to the Eastern Bloc nations right after the wall had fallen. I think it was in 93. And, you know, we were a bunch of, you know, gung-ho American evangelists, you know, and we're going to go over there and we're going to be, you know, great for the kingdom of God. And, you know, we had a, a good heart. So we get on this nice airplane and we go over there and we land and we get out and we're ministering and, and we decide this one day, we're on the streets of this fairly big city, and we decide this one day to go into the marketplace and get ourselves a snack because you know what? Us Americans, we like snacks, don't we? Don't we? Yes. You can see it at every checkout counter that we like snacks because you know, as long as the lines are at Walmart... That's about as long as those stack, those snack stacks are as well. Every kind. And you know what? They're there on purpose, designed with you in mind. Oh, I need one of those. I got to get me two of those. Okay, so here we go. That's good old evangelistic Americans. We're going to just pop into this convenience store which was really their supermarket though it was the size of our 7-eleven and we just dart in there and to our amazement there is barely anything on any of the shelves they are bare cupboards you couldn't buy what you desired even if you had money because there was none. Wow, it struck us like they, they just can't go get it. it it's not just going to be there. Hmm. Well, to some degree, though very minimally, that is what it will be like for people who seek out fresh water in one third of the globe. Those affected by this bit of God's judgment, his wrath, will not find water. And yet, you know what they'll do? They'll, st they'll still seek to drink it. And they will drink it. And because they do, they will perish. Because it's made undrinkable. Sounds like chemical warfare to me. Hmm. Now the fourth angel, verse 12. It says the fourth angel blew his trumpet. And a third of the sun was struck. And a third of the moon. And a third of the stars. So that a third of their light might be darkened. 
and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Wow. Anybody ever seen a full eclipse of the sun? They're pretty trippy, aren't they? They're like spooky to some degree, aren't they? <coughs> You're out there, posed and poised, you know, to get your view of it. And as the sun disappears, whether it's a full one or just a partial, you're going, okay, that's kind of cool, but is it coming back? Is it going to come back? Is it going to come back? And then it starts to come back, and you're like, oh, cool. It's coming back. Well, this won't be like that. And yet, really, it's, it's just what we should expect from the other turmoil that the earth has seen. Again, we have this incredible smoke cloud going up into the atmosphere. Some, some would say this is a, a nuclear winter. And a third of that which gives Natural light is not able to give that light. Now, we've got to realize that at this point even, a lot of the electricity is no longer. You can't go, oh, the sun's going. Bingo. Look at that. <laughs> What's going to be fascinating is during this time, there's not going to be <clears throat> many, if any, left to have the ability to be calm, that is, by the presence of the Lord within us. We can be, though some of us choose not to be calm in hectic and trying situations. We can be. But here, during these judgments, that's going to be gone, by and large. So imagine that just, that fury, that fear catching fire. Wow. <clears throat> it seems that any last hope of finding help from the skies. Remember the earth, the oceans, the fresh waters, they've all been affected. And, and, and now here, uh -huh. hmm. the fourth angel blew his trumpet and the sun was struck. The skies are now affected. Any hope from that last arena, that last area is, is shattered. It, it comes crashing down. Much like 
Anybody growing up, did any of you fear the dark? This moment, I believe, will be somewhat like the flipping off of that light switch in a child's room when the parent leaves and shuts the door. Child thinks it's all alone. Child thinks it's lost in the dark. So too will this lost bit of humanity. Hmm. Anarchy. Chaos. It will be, it will ensue throughout a society that completely unravels and becomes unhinged. Hmm. I believe there's going to be horrific and horrid experiences during this time. Just human on human that will take place. Be unthinkable. Even in what we know is happening today. Have you seen some of the could we define it as, as wicked or evil even? Attacks that are taking place in our cities? The murder of innocent bystanders? As mobs of young people or thieves on a rampage go about doing what they will? Man, imagine when this goes down. It will be like a feeding frenzy. In a shark tank that hasn't been fed for days. Hmm. Now, I don't want to beat a dead horse. And I'm definitely not here to, to toot my own trumpet. But really, just to put things out here and, and to make things or put things plainly. But there are some. There are some, and they're mid-tribbers or post-tribulation thinkers that would say right here, in the midst of this, is the church still. And I say, but wait. Isn't this the wrath of God? And some would say, oh no, this isn't the wrath of God. And, and, and I, I say, if this isn't the wrath of God... Man, folks, clearly this is the judgment, the wrath of the Almighty God. And, and I don't say that to, again, get us off the hook as believers. But Jesus made it very clear. And Paul backed his teaching up. That if, if we will come to faith in Christ, if we will step out and receive the gift of redemption for our soul and become part of the body of Christ, the family of God, that we will be saved from these things. For Paul says, we have not been assigned to wrath. And this is wrath. And it shouldn't be something that we go, oh, whew, good. But it should be something that spurs us on to impact the lives that are around us that are headed into this. 
if they don't come to know Jesus as their Savior. Because folks, we dare not spiritualize this too much. We dare not, to, we dare not to try to talk it down a notch or three just to appease ourselves and say, oh no, God, no, God will. God will judge a sin-sick and Christ-rejecting world. What's incredible to make note of here, what's something, something that we dare, we should not miss in the midst of it. it. Did you notice God's calculated restraint throughout this entire chapter? There, there's one term used multiple times. Again and again and again and again, we hear it in this one chapter. What is it that reveals that restraint? One third. Only one third. Only a third of the sea. Only a third. Wow. Even here. Even at this time, though we all have to acknowledge his judgments are about to get woefully worse. But even at this time, what we see is his long suffering and patient endurance towards mankind, towards rebellious and sinful, and wicked, and unrepentant humanity. And aren't we so thankful for that ourselves? Aren't we? You know, when, when I share my testimony, I usually include the part that says, there was a time in my young life at one point I was. And a, a, a brother of mine shared the gospel with me. And yet I put him off. And I said, hey man, I don't need you. I go to church. I know God. Very flippantly and arrogantly I said those things. And you know, it wasn't for two more years that the Lord once again knocked on my heart and revealed the truth of that message of the gospel. It took me two years to finally go, yeah, I need a savior. My sin is killing me. And it's propelling me into a, an eternity without salvation. I need to repent. Man, you know how grateful I am for those two years? That he didn't snuff me out anywhere in the midst of it? Aren't you grateful for his grace, for his long suffering, for his patient endurance towards you? Hmm. And all with the hopes, all with the hopes at this juncture of his judgments, all with the desire to see some turn, to come to him. Not cry out to the creation. Not hold on to their idols. But to come to faith in the living God through Jesus Christ. Now it's important for us to realize this too. It's important for us because it informs us to inform others, to instruct others. And that is that at this point, that we're looking at in God's judgment, there will be no other earthly refuge. No other refuge, folks. There is no UN resolution. There is no peace accord that is possible. There is no preppers process or procedure that we can go through no, not even an act of Congress. There is no 
relief organization that can even begin to bring relief in all that is taking place. For this, this again is the righteous wrath of God on a sin-sick and Christ-rejecting world. As we step back from these visions of God's judgment on humanity, it is good for us to do as heaven did and pause. To pause for just a moment. Maybe the the greatest reason to pause is maybe you're here this morning and and you don't have the assurance of salvation. You know, maybe you've been playing religion. Maybe you've just, you know, kind of come and gone as you please to church and not the church coming to church and, and, you know, striking your, your card at the door. That doesn't save you. But maybe you thought it did. But maybe you're, you're here this morning and, and you really don't, you don't have an assurance of where you're going to go when this life, your life is over. So maybe it's a good time for you to pause and go, wow, you know what? God is pretty gracious. God's been pretty patient with me. Maybe I need to open my heart, and invite the Lord in to forgive me and be my Savior. If that's you, that's a great pause to be at. But you know, maybe you're here this morning, and you are saved, as many, I believe, are. But maybe, nonetheless, it'd be a good time for you and I to pause and just Man, the worship team's going to be up here in just a few moments and they're going to sing praises. Maybe it's just a good time for you to give thanks and praise afresh and anew for the great grace that he has shown you and the new life that he has given you, a spiritual life from here on into and throughout eternity. Amen? There's a good pause. And if that's you this morning... Maybe this morning would also be a good time to pause and consider some of those around about you in your life that he has put on your heart. He's put in your life and he's put on your heart to share what's really important. That is the gospel. That is spiritual life. That is the consequence of sin, if not turned to at the end of this life. Maybe this morning is a good time for you and I to pause and go, wow, Lord, there are those people that I have neglected, that I have pushed off, or just simply ignored. Maybe it would be a good time to ask the Lord, To give you a heart for them. To reach out to them. And to share the saving grace of Jesus Christ before it's too late for them. And they are plunged into the times that we are discussing this morning. Hmm. Whatever the reason, I think it is a good time to pause. Amen? Amen? If your pause is one over the lack of assurance. You know, the Bible says that we can know that we are saved. God doesn't want it to be guesswork. He doesn't want us to be fretting about it. He doesn't want us to be freaked out about it. He wants us to be faithful in it. In the relationship that he gives to us through his grace. And if you don't have that, so the worship team comes up and the prayer team's gonna be up here. If your need is Jesus this morning, maybe your, your cage is rattled as we've taken in some of these 
coming disasters on planet earth. You know, it wouldn't be God's heart for you to just be rattled. It would be God's heart and it is his desire that you would open your heart to him that he can get you out of the cage and set you free from your sin, amen? So if you need to come to him by faith this morning, man, do just that. Pause to recognize that God loved you so much that he made the plan and he sent his son to redeem you, to pay the price, to be the penalty for your sin and for mine. By faith, step out and and embrace it. Welcome it. Thank God for it. And get busy living for him. Amen? Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for the opportunity to pause in the midst of, Lord, the, the details that you have put before us, Lord, with a purpose. To reveal, to give to us the understanding of things to come. And Lord, as we look, man, there's whew, a lot of a lot of judgment coming, Lord. A lot of your righteous wrath is coming. And so we pray, Lord, that as your children, Jesus, we would take serious, Lord, the days in which you give us to live for you. And that we would be, Lord, diligent in them, Lord, offering them to you, Jesus, to raise good kids, to be good examples, Lord, to our peers. God, to be witnesses unto you in this day and age. Lord, if there's anyone that needed or has said that prayer to receive you this morning, God, I pray that they would step out in faith and let somebody else know. God, that we can encourage them, that we can get them, Lord, your word that can be like that dew in the morning that will satisfy their thirst spiritually. Father, we thank you for a pause to consider, Lord, all that your grace has afforded us. And we pray, Lord, that you work by it continually. You work by it powerfully, Lord, in our lives, throughout our days, for your glory. For it's in Christ's name, amen? Amen. Prayer team is up here. Utilize them, whether it's to let them know you prayed that prayer or if it's something else that's heavy on your heart. Let's stand and worship as we close.